Welcome to another episode of Silicon Minds Human Hearts. Today we'll be interviewing Steve Sweetman, who's the product lead of Azure OpenAI at Microsoft. Steve, thank you very much for joining us today here at the Seattle Reactor. Could you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, as you said, my name is Steve Sweetman, and I have the amazing privilege of leading one of the key products in the space of generative AI today at Microsoft, which is Azure OpenAI. You know, this is the leading service that we have at Microsoft, which offers the amazing innovations from our partners at OpenAI, combined with the platform, the Azure platform capabilities that we serve here at Microsoft. Now, before we go into that, how did you get into the world of AI? Yeah, it's a great question. It actually takes me all the way back, can you believe it, to 2016. Uh, in 2016, at that time, still at Microsoft, I was working in our CTO office. And I was working on the frontier of working on product market fit for new technologies. So as we release something, let's say IoT becomes a trend, what are customers going to do with this? What scenarios will they unlock? And in 2016, the breakthrough at that time was natural language processing. You know, the ability in a sentence to be able to identify a word and understand the intent of the sentence from the word. We had services like language understanding that were just coming to the fore. Well, I still remember the date, March 23rd, 2016. Microsoft Research was using these technologies in a new way to try and create more of a consumer-grade AI experience a bot that could talk to you about the weather, about celebrity gossip, talk to you about the movies, what you want to see this weekend. Well, if we all know the story, that bot's name was Tay. And it took less than 24 hours for some malicious actors to realize that she was training off social media. And they began a data poisoning attack. And Tay went from being friendly, being talking about celebrity gossip, to being racist, hateful, and denigrating. We took her down. Now, while my team wasn't involved in that project directly, we were building chatbots for large brands all around the world. And it was an awakening moment for me because I recognized that while AI ethics was a topic of amazing, interesting research, I didn't think it applied to our customers. And at that moment, I realized it did. It could have been any one of these big brands that we were working with that were suddenly had their reputation damaged or had their customers being offended by the services that we were building. And so I pivoted my career. I thought innovation is interesting, but the area that I wanted to focus on next was thinking about the responsible use of technology. And so I actually took my team, we continued the innovation charter, and we started a charter around AI ethics. And that was my foray really into AI as I started to partner with Microsoft Research with our legal organizations, with policymakers, to think about what our principles for AI are, and how we turn those principles into policies, and then how we turn policies into technology. Well, that's actually, I think, a very good basic to where, where, what you're working on right now, because, well, LLMs these days, there's a lot of legal and ethical parts around it. How does Microsoft help developers to make sure that what they are building is actually ethical, well, we can actually make use of it in an ethical yeah. way or in a legal way? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. It's really been a question that's driven me in my career from that moment. So I spent a year in our legal organization working on policies, but at my heart, I'm a technologist. And I thought policies are great, but unless we empower the individual developers and the data scientists to consider, to think about, to understand, what the socio-technical impacts of these solutions are, the, the policy barriers will just be seen as a friction. And so that's actually what took me back into product building. And I started working first on tools around things like fairness detection and interpretability tools so that you could understand what is my data set and what is my model actually creating. Well, as we then shifted into generative AI, I realized those tools aren't enough. Like tools to understand in the science of building a model needs to shift to be protection mechanisms that we can surround the services with themselves. And so really started to partner together with Sarah Bird, who's our chief um, uh, responsible AI officer here at Microsoft, on looking at how we can actually build a layer of services that developers can rely on. 
And that's how we actually partner with OpenAI in bringing our services to market today. If you use one of our endpoints, you have services like content safety built in. Content safety is taking the same tools that we built for bias detection and for safety detection, but putting it in actually as a service. Like an antivirus running on your PC, it's running in front of your prompts to scan and ensure that no malicious actor is trying to steer your prompt and get it to produce harmful content, like that taste scenario that I described. And we've gone so much further to look at the latest research in key attacks, things like prompt injection attacks, where a malicious user might be trying to steer that system to take action on its behalf and actually create protection mechanisms on top of it. And each of those safety systems, while built into our service, is also available as a service of its own. So any developer can call content safety. They can call prompt injection attack. They can call our grounding service, which will actually use models and science to verify that their application, that their building stays on the guardrails that they're looking for it to stay on. Does that mean that, does that, mean that me as a developer, I can just say I just use the services and I don't need to think about responsible AI? Ah, great question. You absolutely want to think about it. You know, what it's really about is giving developers agency. That is giving developers the controls to determine what level of safety matters for them. To then be able to evaluate with our evaluation tool sets what risks is their application exposure. So do they have a potential for harmful content? Do they have a potential for bias? Do they have a potential that their content is not grounded in their source material? We've got a set of evaluation toolkits that customers can use to evaluate. And then they can rely on the protection services to ensure that those, the risks that they have are minimized. And so that multi-step process is something that every developer needs to think about. They need to be thinking about those risks and they need to be testing the safeguards that are in place as well. Are these safeguards only for the Azure OpenAI models? Or can we also make use of them for, for maybe open source models? That's the great thing. These safeguards, while they're included by default, turned on by default for the Azure OpenAI models. In our AI Foundry service, which is our platform at Microsoft that Azure OpenAI is one of the services, we have over 1,800 models out there. And in fact, one of the key trends we're seeing is customers are using more than one model as they're assembling their solutions. And so those same protections that we have automatically turned on with the Azure OpenAI service is available for developers to enable if they so choose with any of the models in our catalog or any model or application that they want to bring that's even outside of our catalog. Yeah, that's quite nice how that's built in. Now, as the lead, I'm, I'm sure you've seen many applications that has been built by your customers. Anything particular that is really that surprised you is like, well, I hadn't thought about using mm. an LLM in that way. Yeah, you know, kind of the journey that most customers are on start with what I consider as you know basic retrieval, right? In other words, every organization has a lot of content and they're trying to figure out how do we unlock the value of that content? How do we bring expertise to where people are? How do we best use the information we already have? And the retrieval pattern is kind of the standard one there. The next set of solutions, though, that most customers embark on, which begin to really, for me, surprise and delight, are the ones where they begin to reimagine customer interaction. So there's a great startup, Liarbird, actually, out of Australia. For example, that's taken the same retrieval patterns, but they've used that to turn that into patient access together with real-time audio. So with real-time audio, a patient can call up, for example, to make a booking for their next appointment. And the agent will, first of all, based on their phone number, know who they are and can verify. But it can also look at their history. And it can understand all of their medical background. And it can use that information to ask, what are you here for? Oh, yes, I saw we saw you for that last time. What information do you want to add? And because these models are naturally multilingual, of course, it can support people across multiple languages, being able to talk to them in whatever language that they feel most comfortable to talk about what's going on with their bodies or their minds. And that whole booking experience has just been super humanized through the power of these assistants. And it's just been also able to improve healthcare itself because then when that patient shows up for the doctor, the doctor is able to see a summary, not just of the last visit or the last five visits that was manually compiled by a nursing assistant, but a summary of their full medical history that has brought with relevance based on what they're there for today 
that has been summarized by the assistant. And so that's just one example of how AI systems and their power to review information and summarize it is really transforming healthcare. But you could see that same interaction pattern could occur across retail. It could occur across manufacturing and supply chains as you think about all the information you need to bring together to create the response, the answer, the transaction that that customer is looking for. I actually saw an example of this also in the real estate world, which was quite interesting. Interesting. Someone who had built a product in, in Dubai, which was well, pretty cool how wow. they were interacting with their customers. Yeah. Real time is really, I think it's also a game changer, how you can communicate with people. Um, what do you think is going to be next? Yeah, I mean, real time brings that audio fluency together. The big shift that I'm seeing this year has got to be about agents, though, right? And kind of my simple view of this is if you think about the transition we went through on the internet, right? Web 1.0 was all about companies projecting their information online. It was the digital board of here's the products and services that I have publicized to the world with maybe some simple forms for how you contact me or how you can get a hold of me. Then Web 2.0 came along. Web 2.0 was about being able to transact online. With web services, we could now conduct e-commerce. We could have full supply chains that are interacting securely across the internet. Well, as I compare that to generative AI, I think of RAG patterns, retrieval patterns, those simple patterns we talked about as kind of that read-only web, right? It's a way of looking at information and in a basic way, understanding and presenting that information in a more human way. But agents is like web 2.0. Agents, we can now begin to actually transact between generative AI systems. And probably the most you know, forefront of those is in software engineering itself. You know, the amount of productivity that we're seeing our own teams gain by developers using software agents that actually help them not only complete a line of code, but write complete code and complete documents. And accelerating that process is really creating a flywheel effect in terms of the capabilities that we can build for AI, with AI together. Okay. One last question I like to ask all our guests is what tool do you like to use in your day-to-day -day life a lot, which has some AI implemented? Yeah. Can I, can I pick multiple? Yeah, because, sure, go ahead. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, say a builder's house is never finished. And certainly as someone who works in generative AI, there's so many tools out there. There's some that I use all the time and some that I love to learn. Certainly the ones that I'm using frequently are our own co-pilots. So every document that I create now, I use the co-pilot to help me bring information together in our M365 to summarize the document and create it. I've been most recently playing with deep research from OpenAI as well, where I can give it, hey, here's the spec that I want written. Here's my customer evidence that I have compiled. Here's my backlog of information, and it will generate a full spec for me, which is amazing. Then I'll use actually a software agent as part of GitHub Copilot to create a little sample working code for my developers to begin that process of engineering. And so those tools as a product builder are some of the tools I rely on. I also recently went on vacation and I just started playing with some of the tools that are not Microsoft, that are out there on the internet as well. And I was amazed by what you can do in the UI with tools like Vercel AI, with adaptive AI UIs, how you can quickly get started on a on a software project with Vault.new. You know, just give it a prompt and it will create the basic Python working code for you. It's just amazing. And then the simplicity of make.com, very much like our own Copilot Studio, to be able to drag and drop components and wire them together. Those basic building blocks are becoming so sophisticated and yet so simple. I was really inspired on how the, the journey is going to be not just for professional developers, but for people like me, who are actually not a coder by training, but our PMs, our product managers, our, our information workers. It's going to be amazing. Well, thank you very much, Steve, for, uh, for that interview. Uh, looking forward to where Azure OpenAI is going to go next in a couple of weeks, months, who will tell. And uh, we're glad to, that you could make some time for us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.